Hey, what's up? Welcome back to Theory Creep. I'm the Theory Creep, and here we are back in the jungle, because I noticed on that sunset picture I had a little bit of a halo, a green halo going on, so I'm thinking green backgrounds or dark backgrounds might be a way to prevent that. I played with the settings as much as I could, but it wouldn't, this wouldn't go away. Today we're going to be starting the first part of my project, Isolation Switch, subtitle, Fame in the Age of Loneliness. So let's just dive right into it. I mean, I could start with more of an introduction, but you already got that first video. You know who I am. You know what I'm trying to do. Broadly speaking, we're going to be talking about the way that people form their identities on the internet and how that form of identity creation differs from ones that were used in the past. The online celebrity, the online influencer, they play a pretty significant role in this process, and it's hard to ignore them when we look at how the average person, how the anonymous kind of masses form themselves on the internet. They, they do so following the kind of methods and guidelines that uh, are developed by the online celebrity. And the online celebrity, as we'll see, uh, take some of their cues from real world celebrities like Hollywood, film, television actors, musicians, athletes, that kind of thing. But they also really change the way that the celebrity operates. Um, we'll get into all of this in a lot more depth, but that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about self-formation, identity creation, that kind of thing. Uh, the internet as a method of self-presentation and therefore as a means of self-manufacturing and online celebrities as kind of role models in that process. So what is the internet? It's a strange place. Uh, it's, it's forced us to do a lot of things that I think our predecessors, our ancestors, would have found pretty confusing. The internet has forced us to accept a level of virtuality and digitality, digitalization in, in our daily lives that really would have confused people, I think, even 50 years ago. It's forced us to question what's real and what's not, like the, the relationship between the virtual and the material has become a lot more confused as the internet has become a larger part of our daily lives. Like, for example, we just saw Mark Zuckerberg get eviscerated by Congress and that, that, that congressional committee over uh, Facebook ads, over the, the fact-checking on political Facebook ads, potential election disruption, that kind of thing. This is just one example of how the internet is really changing the way that the world operates and how some people are really resisting it and some people are really going with it. And that difference between people's reactions, I think, says a lot about the complexities of the internet as a cultural and social space. Now, this is a cultural theory and deconstruction, postmodern philosophy channel. So, you know, what, what does cultural theory have to say about, uh, about the internet? Well, every branch of cultural theory has got its own kind of opinions on what's happening on the internet. You've got media theorists, you've got language theorists, uh, you've got critical theorists who are coming from kind of a Marxist perspective, you've got cultural theorists who are being more analytical about it. There's a real mess of opinions to some extent, this video series is going to be looking at the differences in those approaches, but for the most part, we're going to be focusing on people that I disagree with, people who have a conservative opinion of the internet, people who think that the changes that are happening online are dangerous or something that we need to be resisting. That's not my position. Obviously, here I am in a completely digital space. Uh, I, I have to accept the importance of virtuality and of the internet as a form of, of connecting with people. So above all, I think that cultural theory is supposed to work for us. It's supposed to be a method that we can deploy in our daily lives that helps us manage the confusion of living in you know the everyday confusing world that the modern world presents us with. So let's let's keep something in mind as we talk about these theorists. 
let's let's keep a question kind of orbiting around our heads. And that, that question is, how do these theories help me? It's very simple. And it's easy to forget when we're reading this abstract esoteric work that, that above all, these theories are supposed to help me manage the world or ma- manage myself in the world. I'm not sure how well modern interpretations of the internet are helping us manage our interaction with it. I think above all, they're being extremely cynical and extremely critical about the kinds of relationships that form online, where they could be being a little bit more analytical and a little bit more objective and offering people who are using the internet to connect with each other methods uh, to understand the relationships that they have. Um, maybe they, maybe these theorists who are talking about the internet, you know, I'm imagining uh, like the ideal internet theorist here, maybe they could offer us ways to get out from the kind of conservative, traditional, materialistic uh, paradigms that have dominated the Western world for a pretty long time. These paradigms that value materiality and physicality over virtuality, I'm not sure how helpful they are anymore. So the online world, and I'm not sure it's so different from the world at large in this way, really demands and simultaneously resists a coherent explanation. We're not, we're not presented with any kind of easy readings of the world, specifically of the online world. But at the same time, we deal with it constantly. So we need to have some systems to understand it, even though it's a very slippery subject that really resists a kind of linear uh, developmental understanding. And this is why I think the internet makes for a fantastic subject for postmodern analysis. So if there's one theory of the internet that I want to be extremely critical of and that I want to come back to over and over again, if there's one approach to the internet, I guess you could call it, it's that the internet and virtual relationships make us lonely, that they they drive us apart, that they don't bring us together. And in fact, they, they create divisions in culture and then also between people the 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 common conception is that technology keeps us away from each other because traditional understandings of being with someone are that you are physically next to them as opposed to virtually with them so i think that that's something we need to reconsider this idea that virtual togetherness or digital togetherness are somehow subordinate to or less important than material togetherness So I've kind of outlined two broad approaches that theorists take to analyzing online environments. The first one is a conservative one, one that says that online relationships deprive us of connections with other people. They simulate togetherness without actually giving us the nourishment of being with another person. And then there's the more progressive, um, optimistic approach that says that the internet is a tool to connect us to each other and that it lets us communicate over large distances, et cetera, et cetera. So these two approaches are the kind of common ones. And obviously they're simplistic. Very few authors would fall strictly into one camp or the other. These, uh, These camps are not equally divided. I think that the vast majority of people who are seriously and professionally commenting on the internet fall into the conservative camp, and they say that the internet drives us apart from each other as opposed to brings us together. Above all, I think these people are backward-looking, nostalgic, and conservative, and also a little bit dangerous. The progressive uh, approaches to the internet, on the other hand, they, they also tend to have problems with them. I think they're a little bit simplistic. I think that the internet is a lot more than a tool to communicate with each other, like the printing press or the telephone or the telegraph. These were tools that let us talk to each other. The internet is a lot more complicated than that. It's creating new mediums, whereas the telephone just let us have a conversation, a pre-existing form of communication over great distances. and, and, And like the printing press, let the written word progress, you know, 
farther than it had before. It let it spread to more people. It lowered the the cost of acquisition for a book. But fundamentally, these things didn't really create new mediums. Uh, sure, I mean, like there's like the the movie phone for uh, for telephones or like the hotlines that teenagers would call in and then answer trivia on. I guess that's strictly speaking a new medium. And likewise, uh, the printing press, I think, I'd have to look into this, I think that the printing press probably created the pamphlet, which, you know, you could argue is a new medium. It used completely different forms than a novel or a book or an essay. I, what I'm trying to say is that the internet is different than the telephone, the telegraph, the printing press, because in addition to being a way to communicate in, in old ways, in old traditional ways, like you can have a conversation, like a virtual telephone conversation with someone on the internet. You can write them an email. Like these are traditional forms of communication, but the internet has also created new forms of communication, such as the one I'm engaging with right now. In the past, if I wanted to have a conversation with, a, you know, I mean, I don't know how many people are going to watch this video, probably very few, but let's say that 50 people watch this video. That's more people than I would have been able to have a conversation with had I not set up a camera and a green screen in my room. I don't know 50 people who would listen to me talk about this shit. I really don't. I might know five. So the internet and YouTube and social media have created new forms of community. And these new forms of community begin in a digital space, but very quickly start to occupy meat space. They start to become material. You can meet someone on the internet and then encounter them in real life. You can arrange to meet a person in real life who you met on the internet. There's multi-billion dollar industries that are based on those kinds of relationships. Dating sites, dating apps, that kind of thing. So this distinction between digital and material is something that's worth considering a little bit. Uh, I mean, I think we all know this, but I'm not sure how much we consider it in our day-to-day -day lives. The, the, the digital worlds that we in, uh, interact with are actually material. They, they exist in server banks, uh, in warehouses you've never been to. They exist in semiconductors and electronic signals inside your devices. They're real. You could touch them and it wouldn't feel very good. It would probably give you a shock, I imagine. I'm not an electronics guy. So these spaces, these digital spaces, are physical, but we only access them through what I'm going to call prosthetics. We, we, we don't have the eyes or the hands to interface with a digital space, so we need prosthetic eyes, monitors, touch screens, that kind of thing, and prosthetic hands, mice, keyboards, touch screens, etc. Without these prosthetic devices, these digital worlds would be completely inaccessible to us and probably not very effective in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, a distinction that we're going to be making probably later on in the series is between digital and virtual, uh, and that's going to be a little bit more complicated, uh, especially if you forget that digital environments are material environments. Now, I don't like divisions like this in general, but for the sake of understanding and for the sake of argument, we will say that virtual environments are non-material. They don't exist in the physical world. They're a mind event. They occur inside of us. And digital environments, while they are intensely virtual and have strong virtual components where our prosthetic monitor, eye, interface devices will help us create a virtual environment that we then interact with. And, and digital virtual environments are much more uniform than traditional virtual environments. In the past, I think Wittgenstein talks about this a fair bit um, with, with his language problems. Uh, in the past, d virtual interior environments weren't really shared environments, whereas the internet offers a plethora of virtual shared environments. You've got video games, you've got social media websites, You've got whiteboards, you've got, um, you've got Snapchat, you've got uh, YouNow. There's all kinds of virtual shared spaces that, that, that we have access to now. 
There's all kinds of virtual spaces that we can share on the internet. And that's another pretty novel thing that the internet has given us. So let's talk a bit about self-presentation. Self-presentation as a form of self-creation. I think that humans, uh, the identities that humans form, they are auto-generative, self-made. They're, they're not something that we're given. We're, we're not handed an identity that's manufactured by someone else. We pick and choose things from our environment, experiences, relationships, role models, and, uh, and then we, we assemble an identity. And I think the way that that identity becomes real is through presentation. So we assemble this story about ourselves and then we tell it to people. And it's in that telling, it's in that relationship uh, where we express ourselves to someone and they interpret that expression. It, it's in that relationship that we become real. Were we to be in a void um, with no one to see us, no one to hear us, no one to interpret who we are, I, I don't think we would exist in the same way that we do now. I don't really think we would exist at all. So self-presentation is a critical tool in self-creation. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the self-presentation tools that are available to us on the internet are, are really fundamentally different than the self-presentation tools that were available to us prior to the internet. The celebrity is a really important figure in understanding these changes. The celebrity offers us an example of someone who is visible to the masses. And this visibility is something that's now available to the masses. As a member of the anonymous masses, I can now set up a camera in my room and I can put on a show just like a celebrity did 50 years ago. This medium used to be selective. It used to be exclusive. It's not anymore. Now it's a massly available form of self-presentation and therefore self-creation. So to understand it, I really think we have to understand celebrities because in a way, what I see happening on the internet is a kind of mass micro celebrity culture where in the past, a celebrity was an exclusive individual who was viewed by the masses. Now the masses are just in a big circle viewing themselves. So we're going to be looking at celebrities real celebrities from Hollywood and television, film, that kind of thing. And we're going to be looking at fake celebrities or virtual celebrities or influencers or social media moguls or that kind of whatever term you want to use. We're going to be looking at both of these people as role models for self-creation in the modern digital world. So this project isn't going to be obviously, it's not going to be traditionally academic. I'm not going to be rigorously looking at research. Uh, there is a lot of research associated with it. But but again, there's not going to be proper citation. There's not going to be a really linear, progressive kind of argumentation going on. I don't have a super coherent thesis. I mean, I just told you the closest thing that I have to a thesis statement, and it it was probably three paragraphs long. This isn't a very specific project. It's very diffuse. And like I said, not academic. It's also not really going to be a memoir or a diary style. Like I'm not just obviously talking about my personal experiences, although the fact that I am engaging with the medium that I'm analyzing is definitely going to come up. Like, like it's, it's worth considering. Like I'll tell you how it feels for me to be forming an identity on the internet through a camera and a microphone. Um, Cause that's, that's literally what we're talking about. And it's something that I'm doing as we're talking about it. So we may as well talk about my experiences doing it a little bit. But again, it's about a lot more than that. It's about culture at large. It's about theories. It's about other authors who are commenting on the culture that we're commenting on. There's a lot going on in this project. And I hope it remains clear to you. If there's anything that gets confusing about it, 
I really hope that I get some kind of engagement from an audience here. That would be amazing, mostly because it's, again, what this project is about. So if, if we can get like a small community going on around these videos where we talk about the things that I'm discussing and, and maybe I can answer questions or or you can answer questions that I have, like I, I think we could we, we could really get something useful going on here if that happens. But above all, what I'm doing is it's, it's an ironic kind of analysis uh, where I'm wandering around the internet and my subject and online celebrities and, and, and I'm just trying to trace the edges of a subject that is quite slippery and quite numinous and, and quite difficult to understand. Like I said, this, this world resists a coherent explanation as it demands one. So this is going to be my attempt to deal with that contradiction. So I used the word irony, and I realized that especially on the internet, irony is a really loaded, complicated term. I don't mean to indicate a lack of seriousness or a tongue-in-cheekness when I say ironic. What irony means to me is a kind of confusing and mixing, a kind of holding two things together that, that don't want to be together, but, but they also need to be together. This isn't my interpretation of uh, irony. It's Donna Haraway's, and she's the author of the Cyborg Manifesto, which is a big inspiration for this project and really worth reading. It's a fantastic book, one of the very few pieces of analysis that I think does a good job of honestly talking about the online world as it is and the online self as it is on the online world. So what does Donna Haraway say about ironic analysis? Well, I'll throw the quote up right there uh, and then I'll read it to you because, you know, I'm not going anywhere. So she says, irony is about contradictions that don't resolve into larger holes, even dialectically. She says that irony is about the tension of holding incompatible things together because both are necessary and true. And finally, she says that irony is about humor and serious play. Now, that's definitely the tenor that I'm going to be trying to strike as I make these videos, a kind of humorous, even though I realize they're not going to be very funny, but they won't be super serious, although they are going to be a form of serious play. I'm not just going to be, you know, dicking around and having fun on these videos, but I'm also not going to be really, you know, like, you know, stiff, stiff upper lip, straight back, telling you what's going on in the world. Like, I'm going to try to ironically find a kind of space between play and seriousness. And, and the idea of a third space in between a pair is something we're going to be talking about a lot as this series progresses. So yeah, thanks for watching. This has been Theory Creep. I'm the Theory Creep. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this introduction to Isolation Switch. Our next video will introduce the first cultural theorist that we'll be talking about. Her name is Faye Alberti. Uh, she is from the UK, and she just published a book called The Biography of Loneliness, or A Biography of Loneliness. Yeah, hope to uh, see you there. Thanks for watching.